Hello, everyone. This is the session called New Priorities for the Export Credit Community. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located. Welcome to you all. I'm Winkel David, the Secretary General of the Bern Union, the International Association of Export Credit and Political Risk Insurers. We have an eminent panel today, including three ECAs and one international lawyer. First, it's uh, Zhao Zheng. She is the Assistant General Manager of the International Department of Sinusure. Then we have Jan von Alberden. He is the Head of Underwriting at Eula Hermes. Then there's Kajin Ko. Um, he is the Vice President of the Insurance and Takaful Department of Exim Bank of Malaysia. And last but not least, it's Matthias Schemut. He is the Head of Finance Projects and Restructuring uh, for Asia at the international law firm DLAC Piper. So let's quickly start with the discussion topics now. The first question, and I'd like to ask that to Jeng of Sinusur, is the following. How have ECAs reacted? How has Sinusur reacted? when it comes to demands for a globally coordinated response to these, what is called unprecedented times. Jane, would you like to comment? Yeah, okay, thank you, Nico. I'm happy to take the lead to answer this question. Uh, as to Sinusure's reaction to the unprecedented times, I would like to summarize in three key words. The first word is adaptation. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, Sinusure adapts quickly, mainly to three aspects. First, standardized pandemic containing measures to ensure staff safety. Second, balance of meeting the increasing client's demand and target of risk management. Third, national policies to stabilize foreign trade, secure the market entities and the key supply chains. Thanks to the joint efforts of all related parties, China's export has resumed and increased for four consecutive months since April. The second word is diversification. Firstly, we tailor-made solutions to diversified clients for diversified markets, including leading industry players and SMEs. Secondly, we enhance the cooperation with diversified domestic and international banks to facilitate the financing. Thirdly, we provide diversified products and services to meet the various market demands, such as specific products to enable import of medical equipment at the initial phase of the pandemic and offer specific biocredit express investigation service to SME clients. The third word is the di digitization. Uh, Sinus is right now conducting internal reform with the uh, digitization upgrading of all business workflows and the service scenarios as the core, aiming at an integrated and user-friendly IT system to foster a high quality service to the clients and ensure a sustainable development of the company. That's all I want yeah, to say. Thank you, Jane. That, that's really impressive, uh, the quick and robust reaction of Sinusure, but I'm sure also other ECAs have had a robust reaction to the developments. Uh, Jan, uh, would you like to say something on behalf of Eula Hermes? Yes, thank you, uh, Pingo, of course. Um, um, let me start with saying that uh, beside the, the direct government support stimulus package of 130 billion euros for corporates in Germany, and maybe you have heard about our famous Kurzarbeitergeld, which was a big success in the 28 crisis. Um, following steps um, have been taken. Um, we have uh, put an early official public publication uh, uh, to our clients and on our website, of course, that um, because of the crisis, we stand ready uh, for support, which means uh, no change in, in cover policy, no change in products, no change in appetite. Um, 
as an experience out of the 28 crisis, we expect that uh, our cover volumes will go up. So we already uh, increased our statutory budget amount so that we are well prepared if the volumes are getting up and we see already <coughs> applications going up. Uh, more from a practical point of view, we have changed our underwriting uh, approach because looking at business models and uh, let's say the, the, the coming numbers, either 2019 or 2020, are not really the basis of uh, taking a decision. So we have decided more to see whether the business model of um, the clients uh, of our exporters are robust and having a look uh, a little bit more back and see whether, let's say, the, uh, the numbers of the last three fiscal years are steady, for example. Um, to a uh, little sentence about our international approach um, with other ECAs. Um, so we have a coordinated approach of Airbus ECAs, um, which means uh, UCAF and BPI for a debt holiday uh, for airlines in trouble. So, I mean, if the business is going down from, let's say, one day to the other, from 100 to nearly zero, then uh, this, of course, would have uh, or has a big impact on on the airlines, and we have a big portfolio there. Um, the same is uh, for the uh, cruise ship sector, where are more ECAs involved. There we have internationally agreed um, a debt holiday for the cruise operators as well. So same situation from one day to the other. Um, uh, the business has gone gone down nearly totally. Um, and on, on, on top, let's say, more exporter-driven, uh, we have um, put together a five-point uh, package um, for our exporters, meaning that we will now allow uh, refinancing and reach back for contracts already under execution. Um, we have implemented a 720-day facility bullet repayment um, and some things more, which I would uh, go come more in detail um, on uh, the one of the uh, questions coming ahead of us. And uh, as already mentioned by Zheng, um, we have implemented an electronic workflow. So nearly 100% of the workforce at Euler Hermes have been working from home and it worked very well. And so we are, we are quite good prepared. And uh, fortunately, um, we have done it already end of last year. So uh, we had not to really start the engines from zero. So I can really say that uh, it's working very well. Now, I would like to move to Matthias. Um, you're not from an ECA, but as a in lawyer, oh. you work a lot with ECAs. What, what do you see as the response of ECAs to, to the different circumstances? Thanks, Pinko. Uh, just in addition to the uh, Corona-19 relief plans and response plans that ECAs are developing, I just wanted to touch on maybe as a legal practitioner, uh, some of the practical aspects and reactions that we're seeing. So I think uh, first message is we're clearly seeing that the ECs are continuing, businesses continuing, uh, the deals that um, have, have been on the, on the table that are uh, going through this period are continuing uh, and ECs are making you know, significant steps to continue to execute and, and be there uh, as normal to go through transactions. We are seeing uh, ECs requiring uh, additional steps, for example, a lot of ECE back deals are requiring development of a, a COVID-19 uh, contingency plan or some kind of business contingency plan. Uh, so that's new in addition to environmental and social uh, uh, plans and, and active action plans. Uh, there's also a focus in documentation, of course, on force majeure. Uh, so when we come to transactions, uh, the ECs and the finance parties all focus on how COVID-19 force majeure could impact the supply chain and impact uh, disrupt the supply or the output uh, that a business is subject to. So it does require additional legal analysis of the risks that might be posed, uh, including, for example, the force majeure, majeure risks that are inherent in a transaction. Uh, there is, of course, also a practical aspect that we are sometimes impacted a bit by uh, the practicalities of execution, with a lot of um, staff uh, being at home, all the parties, um, you know, a lot of parties being in lockdown or at home, not being able to travel, uh, not having face-to-face -face meetings sometimes, not being able to attend site inspections as easily, of course, does have a practical impact, but everyone is working around that. We're hearing the ECAs talking about digitization and people are working on 
uh, you know, vir a virtual basis as much as possible. Uh, maybe some other practicalities where transactions have been ongoing. Of course, there are a lot of uh, asset classes that are distressed. There are a lot of transactions that are impacted. Uh, in that respect, a lot of the OECD country ECAs have put together policies and recommendations. Uh, we see those in practice. Uh, we see a lot of considerations of waivers being given. We've heard um, Jan mention already in certain industries like the aviation industry, you will see discussion of certain payment holidays. Uh, so again, some of those policies are coming through that there is an understanding that in certain industries, there is an effect, uh, things are difficult. Um, so we, we are also seeing certain concessions being made to importers and exporters. There, there are some changes around, um, certainly that we see when we execute deals in practice. Uh, I think other than that, we are seeing, seeing a significant response. Uh, I, I just mentioned briefly, uh, COVID-19 response plans have been developed by numerous ECAs. We've heard a few here. Uh, we're also seeing, for example, a lot uh, with the um, Asian ECAs. The Korean Exim Bank has developed a fund, uh, in particular response, an economic development cooperation fund that has already been active in Africa in lending transactions. JBIC, the Japanese ECA, has been active uh, in supporting Japanese businesses that are affected overseas. Uh, they have opened an emergency uh, response window to the COVID situation for Japanese businesses and an overseas business uh, uh, lending activity. So they provide loans and guarantees uh, through these windows on a fairly short-term basis, fairly quickly to support Japanese businesses overseas that are affected. Um, others like China Development Bank, uh, again, we're seeing very active in lending, co-lending, uh, for example, doing transactions with other national banks in countries that are affected, um, also in, in relation to um, certain industry sectors being very active in aviation and shipping and being a catalyst to supporting the private sector. Uh, so we're, we're seeing specific response plans and we're seeing a lot of activity on the ground in practice as well. There are certainly practical implications to bear in mind. Yeah, thank, thanks, Matthias. So a wide response, both from ECAs, from financiers, from governments. Um, I, I'd like now to focus a bit more on short-term business, which is the bulk of uh, the business uh, of trade anyway. Um, what measures have been taken to support short-term trade? Um, this is the question again to Young. Um, and has cover been extended to short-term trade receivables, what is the appetite for this? Especially because what we see is that companies can get into difficulty now, certainly in short in the short-term trade area. Young, I think short-term short trade uh, is a very significant area. Um, many companies' liquidity position is impacted, in particular in the finance space. Uh, we are dealing with, you know, suppliers, traders. Um, and intermediaries who, whose liquidity position is impacted in a market with you know, price volatility, price uncertainty, um, additional counterparty risk, that kind of situation, uh, and extended payment terms. So as, as the circumstances become more volatile or less certain, uh, increased liquidity is important, and therefore uh, the, the ability to access supply chain financing and receivable financing continues to be significant. Uh, we see a lot of appetite in the market. We see a very significant volume of these kind of transactions for these reasons. Uh, actually, in terms of um, the financings, we see, uh, I'll talk, talk to uh, other ECAs in a minute, but we, we see a lot of transactions in Asia with uh, signatures involvement being supported um, in relation to, for example, receivables in the telecom sector, the tech sector, the automotive sector, the particular sectors where the supply chain uh, and distortions in the sub supply chain uh, can be supported by finance and evened out, where we're seeing you know, significant uh, transactions. And on a lot of those, we, we do see Signature uh, being involved and playing a role. Uh, in short-term financing, uh, that's the situation on kind of outbound into Asian trade. But also on the inbound side, we are seeing a lot of European ECAs supporting equipment financing and also financing on fairly short-term basis coming into Asia. So we're seeing a lot of the European ECAs supporting business, for example, uh, significant volumes into China with uh, Yola Hermes, and Jan will talk to that, and Vera uh, and, and BPI France and others providing cover for eligible equipment. Um, so we're seeing a continuous flow of those deals. Um, also interesting, just to mention, we are seeing the private sector and some multilateral agencies um, coming together to provide uh, new initiatives in this situation. 
So, for example, there is um, a, a new platform that ADB and uh, HSBC private sector are putting together uh, to develop a supply chain financing program, a, a $1.2 billion program uh, as of last month. So, again, there are a number of examples where uh, we see significant momentum. There's definitely a lot of appetite in this market that we can see, Vinko. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matthias, on this uh, com on these comments to short-term trade. And I I'm happy you included both private banks and multilaterals here because they also play an important role. Um, I'd like to turn to Jan now from what Eula Hermes is doing in the short-term area, um, the coverage of uh, trade receivables. Uh, Jan, what is Eula Hermes' uh, experience and response here? There's uh, two, two sides, let's say, the private side of Eula Hermes and the government side of Eula Hermes. Um, and uh, to some extent, a combination of both. So uh, in order to keep uh, underwriting capacity with the private trade credit insurers at uh, high limits, the German government has agreed a rescue shield uh, and signed a reinsurance agreement, which is valid until the end of the year, in order to uh, make sure that the private uh, trade credit insurers are keeping in the market. Uh, and this is... Um, uh, one uh, one step, and the other is that um, uh, the German government uh, has uh, seeking very early green light from the EU in Brussels to underwrite short-term business in OECD countries uh, in order to fill the gap. And, and as I said, uh, to um, <clears throat> uh, to make this gap not too wide, uh, there was this reinsurance agreement with the German government and the private trade credit insurers. Uh, so we are filling then the gap that the private market cannot uh, really do. Um, and I can tell you that demand is overwhelmingly high. Still, there is a uh, reinsurance agreement. Um, we have seen very high numbers of applications. Um, and uh, we have put together a task force uh, to underwrite this business by recruiting really colleagues all over the organization and um, different to 28, um, sorry, different to 20, uh, different to 2008, uh, where we had a lot of time to prepare because the decision of the EU, EU to, to, took longer. This time we had to act, react really quickly because um, the green light from Brussels come very quickly, and um, so we have really uh, to cope with this demand uh, and are still coping, trying to cope with it, um, and. Uh, and again, here helped uh, that we have implemented uh, already an electronic workflow and uh, have here simplified our processes as well and are in discussion with the government really to, um, to simplify it even more. So um, this is uh, uh, what uh, we have been done uh, on, the, on underwriting short-term business in OECD countries. Um, and we see a, an increasing demand on all other countries uh, short-term demand as well. So it's um, it's very, very, very demanding on our side, really, to to cope with the with the demand coming from the industry. Thanks, Jan. And it's it's good to hear how private credit insurers and ECAs work together to continue serving the exporters. Now, Jane, do you want to add anything from the Sinoshore and from the Asian perspective? Yeah. Uh, Short-term trade insurance is actually one of Sinosure's uh, main products from the very beginning. As uh, China's export is uh, predominantly consuming goods and uh, light industrial products. In the past months, our covered amount of short-term trade remained stable. So there are four points worth mentioning. The first is uh, closer cooperation with both policy banks and commercial banks to provide joint solution to exporters, especially the leading industry players. Sandershore's short-term policies act as a crucial collateral for exporters to gain trade finance. Uh, second is a swift response to the pre-shipment risk mitigation demand. Pandemic causes a higher pre-shipment risk protection demand to cover the buyer's cancellation of contracts or refusal to take the delivery. 
With the pre-shipment risk coverage, the exporters' manufacturing risks and the production costs can be covered. Uh, number three is uh, increased coverage of new trading mode. Cross-border e-commerce platform brings new dynamics to China's foreign trade. The pandemic is greatly boosting this new mode. We are taking inno innovative measures to support this new trend, especially the leading e-commerce players. The last point I want to mention is the strengthening of risk management. Risk management is the key to ensure long-term financial sustainability. So a lot of measures are in place to reduce the concentration risk and monitor the post underwriting risk in terms of the short -term business. Risk alert information is frequently shared with clients. Risk screening and the limit adjustment is strengthened for key sectors. Thanks, Jiang. Um, now, th there has been a, a lot of talk about declining exports, but is that really the case as some countries in Asia and the Pacific Rim may even have benefited, maybe because due to other factors? Uh, Kajin, um, where has there been growth lately and what has contributed to this growth? When we look into the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, certain ASEAN countries uh, would have actually benefited from it. But I think that uh, I, would look, I would like to look at it from a uh, segment sector rather. So I'd like to give you an example of what the uh, country in Malaysia is doing. Since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, in terms of the SME companies in Malaysia, They've actually announced uh, ventures into manufacturing of gloves, test kits, personal protective equipment, vaccines, and ventilators. I mean, there is a whole value chain system or ecosystem in the particular country itself. But basically, the COVID-19 has actually uh, hastened the process and subsequent has also hastened the digitalization of the traditional SME markets. So um, let me give you an example, like uh, in terms of uh, commodity markets, such as the natural rubber. For example, the exports of natural rubber has increased. Uh, if I look into the statistics, it has increased almost 14.2% uh, in June 2020. Uh, so these this are something which uh, the, the, the exports growth, we, we see a lot. Main export destination, our usual suspects is China. China contributed almost 68.1% in terms of our rubber, followed by Finland, Germany, and uh, US and Taiwan. Um, rubber gloves has certainly generated a huge uh, income from the well. It has increased uh, by 30.7% from 2.13 billion in May 2020 to 2.78 billion in June 2020, according to the Malaysian statistics. So in terms of uh, the pandemic shift, it certainly has part of the shuffle in terms of the Asia largest stocks with the lights of technology and healthcare. That's something that uh, uh, points to ponder about the changes in terms of the COVID-19. Um, just to give you an example, in terms of the equity benchmark, uh, Globe Manufacturers uh, Equities has surged uh, from 440% to up to 1,100% this particular year. And um, a lot of my colleagues would ask me, what, what are the underlying factors? What contributes to this growth? I think that the SME in Malaysia itself has actually rebounded quite fast, uh, taking into account in terms of what happened uh, way back from December until now uh, from the Wuhan uh, virus coming in, it's very much a fear-driven. Uh, I think uh, as society grows, it is very much uh, health-driven and anticipation-driven. I think um, this particular industry would uh, thrive even if a uh, vaccine is found. I think there are many more uh, opportunities for smaller countries or even emerging ASEAN countries to tap on this. Uh, certainly, I've been seeing uh, certain uh, transactions and even certain talks that uh, SME countries going to other ASEAN countries to basically leverage on this. Thanks, Kajin.
Jane, you want to add something to this? First half of 2020, uh, we see China's uh, merchandise trade uh, declines by 3.2% year on year, but uh, this is much better than expected. Uh, China's trade with ASEAN countries actually increased by 5.6% and reaches 15% of China's total trade volume. So ASEAN countries is nowadays becomes the largest trading partner of China, with Vietnam and Thailand ranking top one and two, respectively. So the factors driving the growth are, first, we think is the regional economic integration facilitated by the ASEAN China Free Trade Agreement, which has been in force during for the past 10 years. Uh, China and ASEAN countries co-beat complementary competitiveness along specific industry chains. In the first quarter of 2020, China's import from ASEAN countries increased by 8% among 8%. Among them, import of semiconductor products grew remarkably by roughly 26%. The second factor we think is the joint building of bed and road initiative steadily goes up. China co-worked with many ASEAN members to build industrial zones, transportation infrastructure, etc., which materially benefiting bilateral, bilateral trade and regional economic development. The last point, as I mentioned, is uh, the cross-border e-commerce greatly China's consumption potential on local speciality products of ASEAN countries like coffee from Malaysia, durian from Thailand, and many others. So I, I, I firmly believe that uh, ASEAN countries and the China's trading will continue growing with the coming signing of the ASEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, to further light up the future of this uh, most popular and vibrant zone. I'd like to focus on what Jan has already said from a German perspective, and that is the following. Um, the market is served by both ECAs and private insurers, um, sometimes also multilaterals. Um, what, what would be the right mixture of serving exporters, uh, both from private insurers, ECAs, others. Uh, Matthias, would you like to say something about that? How, how exporters are best served by what type of institutions? Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, we, we often see deals in practice that have a mixture. Uh, what is the right mixture? And, you know, obviously one, one needs to look at the industry segment, one needs to look at the particular risk allocation in a deal. It's, it's all about risk allocation in the end and who's best placed to bear it. Uh, but we, we see both a, a convergence of ECA cover and a private PRI cover or, or credit insurance cover in many transactions involving trade and commodities in particular, and for a number of different reasons. But just to flag a few, I mean, for one, uh, there may be uninsured loss or uncovered loss. Uh, so commercial banks coming in wanting to make sure that any uninsured, uncovered loss is, is, is indeed covered off uh, somewhere else. Uh, insufficient ECA eligibility content. It may be that um, there's insufficient procurement and therefore a transaction may maximize its lending capacity. So we often have transactions that may have lending limits that may be able to stretch and increase their or maximize their lending capacity. Uh, another aspect would be uh, from a commercial bank perspective, it may be that the commercial bank would otherwise reach lending limits. Uh, so having, having the uh, credit insurance in, in, in place as well may stretch and increase lending limits on transactions or particular names that may otherwise limit uh, or impact on a transaction. Certainly also there can be an impact or favorable impact on pricing and, and interest rates for a transaction. And maybe uh, least, uh, not, not uh, last but not least, uh, one, one more point to make. Um, there, there are of course uh, weaker credits as well where we often find the insurer can come in or the insurance cover can come in to uh, credit enhance a transaction. So in particular, when you're dealing with sponsors or underlying uh, participants in a transaction where there's a credit risk borne by that particular party, it may be that the equity commitment to a transaction or the, the sponsor could be credit enhanced uh, by means of this kind of separate cover uh, that isn't necessarily the product covered by the ECA. So there are a number of different reasons and kind of combination of reasons we see 
why the two live you know together yeah thanks uh, matthias um uh, kajin how is that from your perspective the the best mix to help exporters uh, very similar to to what uh, matthias has uh, actually mentioned but however i just like to stress uh, the difference between when we talk about private insurance and uh, export credit agency uh, in a nutshell private uh, insurers are much more commercial and profit driven Wells, a export uh, credit agency, would very much be mandate driven. So it really depends on what the uh, country or any ASEAN countries would actually allocate the budget for the particular year. But I think in a nutshell, I think that um, in uh, Malaysia itself, it's more prevalent to the PRI market, the political risk market. In terms of the short-term uh, credit uh, proposition, we still have the sufficient capacity. There are times that uh, we would actually reach it out. Uh, those are essentially the left pocket and right pocket in terms if it is a banking proposition and it is something that uh, we are not very comfortable. Certainly, uh, reinsurance uh, do come in. It comes in either a tricky form or a facultative uh, form. I think in uh, Malaysia itself, uh, in terms of the collaboration, um, there were times that uh, we used this uh, from a perspective of a fronting arrangement, uh, very similar to the other European uh, countries. Uh, there could be certain issues, such as capacity issues, sector issues, basically uh, very much uh, selling off the risk, uh, or actually sharing the risk uh, within the, the other uh, private insurers. I think what works for us um, in Malaysia perspective is uh, we look into the political risk uh, side in terms of the very advanced uh, development of the PRI market. Uh, we do take uh, note that uh, some Lloyd's wording or some syndicated wordings could be actually beneficial. And we actually like to use uh, a complementary between several private insurers or sometimes even collaborate with uh, several ECs on a particular role. So I think in uh, conclusion, uh, despite concerns that some would mention that ECs crowd out the private sector, public and private interests have a large role in terms of a complementary role. So that's my take. Yeah, thanks, Kajian. Indeed, it's the complementary role of ECAs and private insurers that, that continue helping exporters in, in these times. Um, now, it may not have always been the case this way in previous crises. Jan, you already alluded to it, the difference between how currently ECS and private insurers are cooperating and quickly responding to the crisis compared to what happened during the previous crisis, which we may almost have forgotten already, the credit crisis in 2008 and 2009. Young, young, what's the difference in response? Um, I mean, I'm a dino and I was already in the business in 2008. And um, at that time, um, the problems came from the financial markets. And now it's completely, not completely, but many, in many ways different because there's a direct import, impact on, on our exporters because supply chains have been disrupted, stop of execution of projects, suspension of project, projects, sales forces couldn't travel to, um, to take on new business. So um, the, 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 it's in many, uh, many ways different to, um, to the financial crisis 2008. Um, I can say that uh, some of the measures from 2008 are still uh, in place uh, in our system. So uh, the very low self-participation for supplier credits, for example, is still coming from the 2008 crisis and still in place. And um, the improving uh, refinancing possibilities for banks um, under a government program uh, kind of a safe haven is still in place. Um, this time, um, as I uh, tried to explain earlier, we have um, uh, taken uh, some additional uh, measures uh, allowing, for example, as I said, refinancing with reach back for con contracts uh, already under execution to help the, the clients of our exporters uh, if their financing has gone, for example. 
Um, the 720 days bullet uh, facility is 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 new. Um, it, again, to help um, the clients of our exporters, if there is a is a gap in their financing possibilities. And um, as uh, Matthias already mentioned, uh, we have uh, questions and um, uh, being, be, being approached by our exporters um, um, to give waivers and uh, uh, and because uh, co contracts ex execution is, is um, uh, postponed and many, especially in the field of supplier credits, uh, asking uh, or getting asked by their clients uh, to prolong repayments um, for the contracts under execution. Uh, so we have um, uh, responded to that in a way that we have simplified our process there so that we can get out a very quick um, answer to our exporters and uh, have decided uh, not to um, not to ask for any on top premium for prolongation uh, for contracts uh, being impacted by the crisis, for example. Um, and as I said, uh, one big step I think is the change in underwriting uh, approach in order to keep uh, to keep appetite. This is uh, also new uh, this time. So we are more focused uh, and had to be quicker than uh, in the 2008 crisis and more focused on the exporter side and not so much on the financing side. Uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, also to you, um, Matthias, what have we learned from the crisis in 2008 that we're doing better now? Yeah, uh, I mean, just to, to compare and contrast the two as far as I can see, I mean, the 2008 GFC was really a, a liquidity crisis. Um, it's often called a credit crunch. So as, as Jan mentioned, you know, it came from... Uh, subprime, it came from financial products and, and undue you know, stress and risk being taken. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis, of course, has different origins and um, is really a crisis that people describe, describe as being a supply and a demand-led crisis. So I, I think we're dealing with, you know, on the demand side, we're dealing with people who are dealing with lockdown, uh, restricted travel, uh, people are being cautious about their spending, businesses are being cautious about their investment, uh, the demand has been impacted. Uh, from a supply perspective, you know, we, we've lived in an era for a long time of reliance on um, international just-in-time sourcing, and that model of manufacturing and that supply chain uh, may be impacted, and, you know, we may need to visit and, and relook at how, how businesses uh, view supply and, and finance supply accordingly. There may be more local or regional production that, that follows as a result. So this crisis is much more uh, something that I hear people talk about being a demand and supply-led type crisis. Uh, it's also different, just obviously as a practical perspective. Uh, nonetheless, um, the ECA's role and the, the governmental lending agency role is still significant. It is still seen as a lender of last resort. The ECA's and governmental lending agencies are still helping uh, in a situation where the commercial market is not alone able to provide sufficient liquidity and finance, it is still important as a catalyst. Uh, they can still still take longer term risks that others may not be able to. So it's still very important as a st stimulus and very much relevant to you know continue driving the economies. Uh, of course, at a practical level, things are different. We are dealing with uh, lockdowns, constraints, people working from home, um, the ability to execute transactions and talk to people and deal with your credit officers or whatever uh, is, is different in the current climate, of course. The ability to uh, have meetings and inspect transactions and, and uh, sites changes the execution. So we are impacted, of course, on, on a logistical perspective. Um, also, this crisis is different because very particular industries have a direct um, impact. So obviously, tourism travel has been directly restricted and therefore aviation is impacted. Uh, shipping to some extent has been impacted. You know, automotive industry, people are cautious about buying cars. Uh, there are certain industries that are more impacted than before. Okay, thanks, uh, Matthias. Uh, we are nearly at the end of this panel, but um, we, we have looked at the current situation. We have looked at what happened in the past, what, what the industry has learned. Um, I'd like to give each of you just a one minute opportunity to have a forward looking uh, last word. Um, can I perhaps start with the Kajin? 
I think that I'm, I'm very positive. I think that uh, digitalization would drive the new normal as uh, what uh, everybody would uh, advocate. I think uh, in terms of uh, trade, uh, it would be very much uh, business. We still need to do trade, uh, especially from a country, from a trading nation, that uh, trade is uh, essential. I think in terms of the evolution of trade, we need to find a, a middle ground whereby you could actually look into terms of doing business while sustaining uh, or keeping track with the current situation in terms of the pandemic. Um, this is one of the examples. I think challenges will always come in terms of trade. Uh, very, very essentially, I think that uh, moving forward, uh, we need to be very, very uh, sensitive about the environment. We need to be very, very sensitive about uh, issues uh, that could be as a result of another um, uh, another aspect of stuff. And I think that we need to take heed and to move forward. Thanks, Kajin. So the change is going to stay. That That is what you are actually saying. And, and I do agree, we will not go back to the situation as it was uh, in 2019. There is a permanent uh, change in how we trade. Um, Young, just in one minute, how, how do you see the future? Yeah, good question, Inko. Uh, I have not the crystal ball with me, but uh, I very much extend that uh, the things or how we are doing business will, will change even if the pandemic is over. I think travel will travel and face-to-face -face meetings will go down to some extent. Of course, there are some meetings uh, and face-to-face -face meetings um, absolutely necessary to, to do business, but uh, not to the extent uh, we have done it before. I very much think so. Uh, I think that, uh, especially in Germany, many corporates already rethink their their sourcing, um, whether this globally uh, international supply chain is really a good issue, I don't know. I, I, the, the, the rethinking has been already started, and, um, and I think uh, the digitalization uh, process needs to be even more speed up, so I think, um, I mean, I have not, not left so many time uh, because I'm um, I'm getting getting to retirement in some time, uh, but I think the digitalization will really go on and uh, has to be speeded up in order to really to deal with the future. Thanks, Jan. Two very important points: the digitization or the further digitization in our industry and trade in general, and perhaps shorter supply chains. Uh, Jane, do you want to add anything on your future perspective with just a few words? Yeah, when we think in China, the Chinese expression of crisis is uh, consisting of two words. The first uh, meaning danger, the second meaning opportunity. So with Chinese philosophy is that there's always opportunity at critical moments. So my view is that uh, the economic globalization is a re uh, irreversible trend. There will be definitely new market opportunities arising in the reshaping of international industry chain and the supply chain. And I firmly believe that uh, we ECA communities will play a more important role in fostering the global trade and the, at the same time take the chance to speed our own internal reform and management uh, upgrading to enable ourselves to be more efficient and uh, more resilient. Thanks, Jing. So a greater role for ECAs to help exporters and globalization will not go away. Maybe we'll slow down, but will certainly not go away. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Matthias, a few words on how you see the future. Uh, thank, thanks. In, in summary, I think there will be ongoing reliance and, uh, on ECE and government ed financing. I think that will continue to play an important role, in particular while I think there may be some continuing uh, ongoing uh, constraints within commercial lending markets. Uh, I think also we need to get used to more flexibility generally, more flexible working, but also more flexibility around a number of different things, such as the, the products that we look at. In that respect, it'd be interesting to see in the future how ECAs uh, grapple with new products and look at, for example, the bond markets. Uh, we also talked about co uh, cooperation, enhanced cooperation between the ECAs. I think that is important. We've talked about 
And I agree with everyone, digitization. Uh, we are seeing digitization very much in trade finance. We're seeing a lot of uh, platform transactions being done in the supply chain. Uh, I'd love to see that technology and, and that way of thinking being developed more in the ECA, ECA community as well. Thanks, Matthias, and thanks to all of you for this great panel. We have discussed a wide array of topics uh, that are affecting trade, trade finance, trade credit insurance projects. Um, you have tried to look at it from many different angles. Just a few conclusions I'd like to draw. Um, digitization is was already on its way but has certainly got a boost during the corona crisis because you cannot do everything on paper or in meetings second it has affected supply chains to what extent it is affecting supply chains it's not yet entirely certain but something of a sort re-regionalization of supply chains uh, third, um, we are waiting for insolvencies. We have not seen them yet. Nobody talk about, of you talked about insolvencies because we haven't seen the big wave of insolvencies yet. But they may come once government measures will be terminated. And that moment will come one at one point in time and then we as credit insurers and ECAs need to be prepared for that we need to be prepared to quickly pay claims to our insurers but also to continue underwriting for sound business and lastly what I want to add is the great cooperation between all the stakeholders to help exporters that is ECAs credit insurers multilaterals banks we all need each other to get through this crisis and to be prepared for the upswing that will certainly come thank you very much